Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Erin Viner. In our top story, Israeli tanks and jets responded with strikes against Gaza terror installations run by Hamas after two successive days of rocket fire from the Palestinian territory. Residents of southern Israeli communities were again sent running for shelter amid the blaring of air raid sirens. One of the missiles nearly missed homes in the town of Sterot. No physical injuries were caused, although several people were treated for shock. Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman made it clear there is no plan to launch a military operation into the terrorist hotbed at this time, but he repeated that no violations of Israeli sovereignty will be tolerated. In response to the escalation from Gaza, additional residential bomb shelters are being built for vulnerable Israeli communities bordering the Islamist-run Palestinian enclave. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed that the attacks will not go unpunished, stressing that during its 2014 war with the Jewish state, all Hamas attempts to infiltrate Israel were repelled and most of the Muslim extremist missile arsenal was utterly demolished. Netanyahu went on to warn that further attacks against the Jewish state will bring about the terror group's destruction. The Prime Minister's statement was issued just before a terror attack in Jerusalem that claimed the lives of two Israelis and wounded five others. Hamas celebrated the murders and announced the Arab-Israeli gunman who opened fire at Israeli passers-by was one of its operatives. A 60-year-old woman died of her injuries and a 29-year-old police officer fell in the line of duty in pursuit of the terrorist who was killed by security forces. The Muslim gunman was supposed to have turned himself into authorities the same day to begin a four-month prison term for several charges, including incitement to terrorism on Facebook. Public Security Minister Gilad Erdan placed responsibility for the attack squarely on social media sites that permit online Islamist extremism. He pointed out that only a few weeks ago, Facebook succumbed to public pressure from Palestinians and reopened several Hamas hate pages that had been closed. There is increasing speculation that the nephew of late PLO terrorist leader Yasser Arafat may be tapped to be the next Palestinian president. Nasser al-Kidwa is the son of Arafat's sister. He appears to be the leading candidate amid reports that Arab states are pressuring PA President Mahmoud Abbas to name a successor in the event of his inability to lead. According to a physician at a hospital in Ramallah, Abbas had a catheter inserted in his heart this past week. It has long been believed that the 81-year-old leader suffers from cardiac problems, even though regime officials have refused to confirm this. He became the head of the Palestinian Authority after Arafat's death in 2004 and refuses to step down even though his term expired seven years ago. The United Kingdom has become the first country to suspend financial assistance to the Palestinian Authority amid charges that taxpayer money is being dispersed to Islamist terrorists. The freeze was ordered by Britain's Department for International Development after lawmakers demanded action be taken. There have been numerous recent reports that Ramallah has been using aid money meant for civilians to reward Arabs who murder and attack Jews. According to PA law, the amount of blood money given to the terrorists and their families rises depending on the severity of the act. The UK decision means that over $29 million in cash will be withheld from the PA this year. Senior Iranian officials snubbed Germany's Vice Chancellor Sigmar Gabriel after he announced to have a visit to Tehran that Berlin will only fully normalize ties with Tehran if the Islamic Republic recognizes Israel's right to exist. Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Zavad Zarif and Parliament Speaker Ali Larijani abruptly canceled their meetings with Gabriel, who also serves as his nation's economy minister. The German official was among the first of the Western leaders to lead a delegation to the Iranian capital following the removal of key nuclear-related sanctions in January. Iran's judiciary chief said that given the power to do so, he would have banned Gabriel from even visiting the country altogether. Even though Berlin is anxious to reclaim its role as one of Iran's major trading partners, it has long condemned the rogue state for its frequent denial of the Holocaust and calls for Israel's destruction. Ukraine has announced plans to finally honor the Jewish victims of the Babi Yar massacre during the Holocaust. President Petro Poroshenko revealed plans to build a memorial center at the site where the Nazis and their collaborators gunned down more than 33,000 unarmed Jewish men, women and children 75 years ago. The 1941 killing spree, which lasted two days, was one of the most heinous atrocities of the Second World War. 
It marked the start of the Holocaust in Ukraine, where the pre-war Jewish population of about 1.5 million was virtually wiped out. Poroshenko said, it is extremely important for all of humanity to remember the origin and bloody history of the Holocaust, which should serve as a warning to present and future generations about the dangers of hatred, fanaticism, racism, and intolerance. Italy's national soccer team has been slapped with a $30,000 fine for anti-Semitic behavior by fans that occurred during a September 5th match in Israel. During the playing of the national anthems, many of the Italians stood and made fascist salutes. The sport's governing body, FIFA, condemned the behavior as improper and discriminatory. The decision was hailed by the Union of Italian Jewish Communities, which first brought attention to the incident on its news website. An Israeli diplomat just chaired a committee at the United Nations for the first time in history. Diplomats from Iceland, Norway, Korea, and many other member states congratulated Israel's UN Ambassador Danny Danone on his election as head of the Legal Committee, which is one of the main bodies of the General Assembly. It's also the primary forum for the UNGA's consideration of legal matters. The only representative to speak out against Danone's appointment was, predictably, from the Palestinian delegation. This week, Jews around the world will dwell in tabernacles as commanded by the Bible in Leviticus chapter 23. It's truly a special time in Israel where makeshift booths can be seen in yards, porches, and patios. The Bible instructs Jews to take up the four species, which include a palm branch, etrog, myrtle, and willows. The festival of Sukkot has become a most popular time for Christians to travel to the Holy Land in fulfillment of the words of the prophet Zechariah, who said that it shall come to pass that all nations would come up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Aaron has more on this story. Yes, that's right, Yochanan. Tens of thousands of Christians are currently visiting Israel and participating in the Feast of Tabernacles hosted by the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. This mega event has become a beacon of Israeli Christian cooperation and is attended by Israeli parliamentarians and Christians from around the world. The event concludes with a march throughout the holy city of Jerusalem, with Christians and Jews waving Israeli flags together and singing the national anthem of the Jewish state. Sukkot is truly an exciting time to visit the Holy Land, and we at Israel Now News would like to invite you to join us here next year. Happy Sukkot, or as we say in Hebrew, Chag Sukkot Sameach. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here on a beautiful sunny day in Jerusalem. My guest today is Fleur Hassan Nahum. She's a city councilwoman for the city of Jerusalem. Fleur, thank you for being on the show. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. First, tell our viewers a little about what is the municipality of Jerusalem? Does it work like in every other city, or is there something special about it? Well, there's always something special about anything in Jerusalem, but uh, the Jerusalem municipality is local government the way that it would be in any other city. Um, we have 30 council members that are elected. It's not a regional election. It's an all-out city election. And then you have 30 city councillors and you have a mayor. And we have power to decide anything on municipal matters, such as transport um, and the way the education system is run in the city, tourism for the city, the way we develop the city in terms of business. Obviously, foreign policy is not something that we determine on a local level. But we pretty much determine everything to do with our city and the smooth running of our city. Coming up this week is the big Feast of Tabernacles. Jerusalem is flooded with thousands of Christians from around the world. How important is this uh, holiday for tourism and for the city of Jerusalem? Well, it's a wonderful festival and we love having visitors in Jerusalem. We're always very excited when our Christian friends from all around the world come here and enjoy everything that this amazing city has to offer. Um, we open our doors. We want everybody to enjoy not just all the biblical stops on the tour, but also the, the modern city that also is Jerusalem, the coffee shops and the restaurants and the shopping. Um, we are very happy that uh, our friends from around the world come and visit us on the Feast of Tabernacles and we want more people to come, welcome. 
Jerusalem is uh, holy to three main faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. How does that work? Is, is there peace? Is there prosperity? Is there conflict? How do the, the three main groups live together side by side? Uh, that's a great question, Josh. And the truth is that the thing that I'm most proud about as a representative of the city of Jerusalem is the religious freedoms that Jerusalem gives all its faiths. The fact that Christians are welcome to come here and can go and visit all the holy sites. The fact that Jerusalem as a city protects the holy sites, the churches of Christians and also Muslims is something we're extremely proud about. It's something that we will continue to fight for and support. And yes, there's always conflicts in this city. They, it, it's, it's a difficult and challenging political situation. But at a municipal level, we try and be as fair and egalitarian as possible for all the populations here to receive the services that they deserve as residents of the city. You know, if you watch the international media, you'll think that Jerusalem is a dangerous place, maybe, yet statistically, we're the safest capital in the world. Where is the disconnect there? Well, you know, the media always portrays the, the dangerous parts of, of any part of the world, especially one like Israel, which is always in the news. And I'm not going to say that there's no difficulties in Jerusalem. Of course there are difficulties. And of course there are things that we always need to improve um, in order for it to be really a city of peace, which is the name Jerusalem, the city of peace. However, I always, you know, find the statistic amazing that more people die of car accidents in Israel in general than they die from any type of terrorist situation. And therefore, I would say that we are a safe city. We are a safe city because safety is a very important aspect to us, but also because people actually just want to live peacefully every day side by side. The municipality of Jerusalem has done incredible outreach to try to bring more Bible-believing Christians to the city, to witness the city for themselves. Why is the evangelical Christian community important for tourism in Jerusalem? Well, first of all, we believe that the evangelical community is one of the best friends that we have around the world. It's important for tourism in Jerusalem because the evangelical community want really to get to know intimately the city of the book, the, the, the book of Abraham and Isaac and also Jesus and the way that he found this city and this was his city as well that he found so special and he cried for. So therefore, um, I believe that it's incredibly important that our friends around the world, our Christian evangelical friends, come to Jerusalem, get to know Jerusalem, feel a part of Jerusalem. This city also belongs to the three major faiths and so we want people to come here and enjoy everything the city has to offer. And like I said earlier, not just the biblical Jerusalem but also the modern Jerusalem, the place that you will enjoy to also bring your kids to uh, and enjoy the beautiful views that you see here and also the cultural activities that the city has to offer as well as the biblical and religious activities. So we would love to see all of you here. Fleur, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for a viewing audience? Jerusalem is sometimes a city that is seen as a city of conflict. And there are problems. And there are problems that we, as a municipality, work hard every day to try and solve. But there are people here who want our friends to come to Jerusalem, who work hard for every resident of Jerusalem, for them to have their place and to feel at home. We have a long way to go, but this is already an amazing city that we hope all of you can connect to on a personal level um, as well as on a religious level. So please come. We would love to have you here. I would love to welcome you all very soon. Thank you, Fleur, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, wishing you a happy Feast of Tabernacles. Now back to the studio. Up next, return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. Shalom and welcome to the Return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. I'm Eliezer Moody Sandberg, World Chairman of Keren HaYesod, United Israel Appeal, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. 
Due to the rise of anti-Semitism, the Jews of France are coming to Israel like never before. You will now witness the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. God bless you from Jerusalem. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Both the departure from France and the reception at Ben Gurion Airport were colorful and festive events, full of hope for the future. The reception at Ben Gurion had the feel of a homecoming celebration with flags and greetings, designed to convey to the Olim that they have come home and that everything possible would be done to guarantee a promising future for them and their children and to ease their absorption. It began with the receiving Israeli ID cards already at the airport and will continue with the help of a special program designed to streamline the bureaucratic process in the fields of employment, education, and housing. אני רוצה לברך אתכם בשם משפחת קרן היסוד העולמית. זה רגע מרגש עבורכם וגם עבורנו. המדינה הזאת שייכת לכולנו. לא משנה איפה אתה גר, כחלק מהעם היהודי, ישראל היא המולדת שלך. קרן היסוד מגייסת תרומות, ויחד עם הסוכנות היהודית, השותפה שלנו, ומשרד הקליטה, אנחנו עוזרים לחלום הציוני להתגשם. The Jewish community of France is the largest in Europe, numbering half a million Jews. We are the real Zionists, we love Israel, and it's not by fear, it's not by love, because we wanted to live here, we wanted to live in Israel. I'm very excited and I don't realize it. I have to prepare this for years and years. A lot of joy, a very great emotion. I have a lot of tears in my eyes. Et j'espère que tout le monde pourra réaliser ce rêve un jour. C'est un projet de vie, ça fait... Euh, depuis qu'on est marié, c'était notre projet de monter en Israël. Je trouve que c'est très impressionnant euh, d'arriver dans un nouveau pays dans lequel on, on se dit euh, on va arriver, on connaît entre guillemets personne, seul, et au final... Euh, c'est impressionnant, impressionnant. Parce qu'on n'est pas seul et euh, vraiment... C'est bon. Il n'y a que Israël pour faire ça, c'est vraiment... Euh, voilà. Mesdames et messieurs, le Premier ministre de l'État d'Israël, M. Bibi Netanyahu. Bonjour tout le monde, bienvenue en Israël. Il y a une ville mafouère, que les Yéhoudim qui ont venu de Tzarfat, ils vous appellent et vous appellent. Mais tout le monde vous appellent. Nous vous aimons, nous vous aimons le travail de la vie de la vie, qui est aussi un travail d'échec. C'est un travail d'échec grand et un travail d'échec grand. Come join Karen Aesod in fulfilling biblical prophecy. Let's bless Israel together. To donate and get information, call us at 1-800-505-1665 or visit our website at www.khisrael.org. I've just watched a video that shook me to the core of my being. In just a few seconds, it shows why our conflict persists. So here's a short snippet. <laughs> A Palestinian father holds up his four-year-old son. 
He pleads with Israeli border police to kill his own child. He shouts, shoot this little boy, his boy. He pushes his young son forward towards the soldiers and screams, kill him, shoot him. The boy pauses. He's scared. Any child would be. He turns back, looking at his father for guidance. With his shirt tightly tucked into his bright red shorts, the boy ambles forwards towards the soldiers. One of them extends his hand in friendship. The boy gives him a high five. It's hard to make a four-year-old hate. Imagine your own child at that age. Think of his smile. Imagine her laugh. Picture the unrestrained joy and, and innocence that only a child possesses. Encouraging someone to murder a child, let alone your own child, is probably the most inhumane thing a person can do. What did this child do to deserve this? The answer is nothing. He's innocent. He should be in a playground. He should be in the sun laughing with other children. Sadly, this father's crime is not an isolated example. In Gaza, Hamas runs summer camps that teach children to value death over life, suicide kindergarten camps. The Palestinian Ministry of Education in Ramallah recently organized an event for students to honor terrorists who murdered three civilians. Two weeks ago, the Palestinian Authority's official newspaper praised teenage terrorists and wrote that death as a martyr is the path to excellence and greatness. That's a direct quote. Palestinian and Israeli children deserve better. They deserve to live. They deserve to live in peace. Children are not cannon fodder. They're the most precious things in the world. They're the most precious things we have. I'm sure Palestinian parents, many of them, are as outraged as I am at this video. And today I appeal to every father and mother around the world. I ask you to join me in calling for an end to this abuse of children. The Palestinian leadership must stop encouraging children to kill. They must stop encouraging Palestinian parents to call for the death of their own children. It's horrendous. Peace begins with respect. If parents don't respect their own children's lives, how will they respect the lives of their neighbors? We must love all children. They should never be pushed to violence or hate. Join me in educating all children for peace. Please stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. You know, when we talk about home, the first association is to speak about family. And this home indeed has become family for the survivors. It all started in 2010. Shimon Shabak, who directs today this house, he had a small soup kitchen here in this neighborhood. And he saw that Holocaust survivors were coming to his soup kitchen and he felt if there are needy Holocaust survivors, we need to do something about it. And he asked us to come and he showed us a small apartment where he wanted to host 13 Holocaust survivors. He said, can the Christian Embassy help us to purchase that building? I looked at the entire building, which was a four-store building. I felt the Lord talk to me and I said, Shimon, why don't we buy the entire house? I was driving away from Haifa and I thought, oh my gosh, what did I do? And how do we ever get this money together? I was pleading with the Lord, please help us. We have five months time to get the money together. For me, the biggest miracle was to see within two weeks, people were sending us so much money like never before that after two weeks we could purchase that building. And within those five months which we had, we could even purchase two buildings. I see that there is a hand in this place. And without the work between the Nazi and the Nazi, 
המקום הזה לא יכל להתפתח. אז אני רואה בזה במדרגה ראשונה את הדבר הטוב ביותר שקורה, ולא סתם אה, באים לפה בני נוער, אה, חיילים, שהם שומעים שנוצרים, הם מחזיקים את המקום, הם מתנדבים במקום, זה מראה שאפשר גם את ההיסטוריה לשנות בצורה טובה, והשגרות הנוצרית היא דוגמה לכל הנוצרים בעולם, איך אפשר לעשות דברים אחרת, ואתם עושים את זה גם ככה. What I could see is that this house is providing an inner healing to those people to deal with their past in a, in a positive way. You know, as a German, to see this home, and it's very humbling in many ways. You come from a country which uh, wrote the darkest chapter of Jewish history, and today to be here and to see that you are able to open a new page in the life of the Jewish people, that's it's very touching. People from all over the country, they are applying, we want to be at the home for Holocaust survivors. And the very sad story for me is that many of them we have to tell, no, we don't have the finances to add more people to it. So it's really my vision that by the end of this year, even we have a hundred people here, or that we can expand this house here in this next few years, uh, even for a couple of hundred survivors. Time is running out in Israel and we need your help to continue this operation here in Haifa and even to expand it. The keys are in your hand. Please help us to open the door and welcome them home. Are you a pastor or church leader looking for fresh vision for your ministry and a chance to see what God is doing in Israel? Join us in Jerusalem for the Envision Pastors and Leaders Conference. You will have the opportunity to connect with local Messianic and Arab pastors, receive exclusive briefings from key national leaders of the State of Israel, and enjoy special times of worship and prayer. To learn more about the annual Envision Pastors and Leaders Conference, visit envision.icej.org. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rom. And I'm Erin Viner reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.